nation because we don't accept it. Therefore, you have to treat them as natural men. What did he mean by that? You need to treat them through their reason. This takes us back to the uh, Regensburg lecture. As the Pope said there, it's only when reason is accorded a certain stature as capable of coming to know the truth that it can be the source of dialogue between two different faiths that don't accept each other's revelation. So treat them as natural men. The problem here is that in the Muslim mind, men are by nature Muslim. In other words, Father Fisher, I hate to tell you this, but you were born a Muslim and you were apostatized by your parents. I once said this to a cardinal. <laughs> I can't tell you the look he gave me. Therefore, someone does not so much convert to Islam as they revert to Islam, since Islam is known as, by Muslims, you are spared by penance, the Deen al Fitra. The Deen al Fitra is the, the religion natural to men. So, you know, you, you've heard in Western philosophy all of these speculations about man and the state of nature. Well, in the Muslim world, uh, we're all Muslims. Adam was a Muslim. Uh, Abraham was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. And, of course, Muhammad was a Muslim. So what they are bringing us all back to our natural state by uh, attempting to uh, bring us into subjection to Allah. So I hope this evening I've given you at least a little introduction of how uh, Muslims see themselves and how they regard us. And then what I propose to do next week is to show how close it came, what a close call it was, that Islam was almost Hellenized, that Islam almost established the integrity of reason in such a way that the dialogue that Benedict XVI suggests uh, could have taken place and why it is so, so very hard uh, for that to happen today. Let me stop there and uh, take your questions. Thank you very good. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowe. We're going to take our usual break. Thank you very much. Mr. Riley, one of my favorite movies is The Young Lions, in which Marlon Brando plays a Nazi officer who genuinely believes in the early frames of the movie that he's fighting for peace. How does the salam that you describe in your lecture differ from the peace sought by Nazism or Stalinism or any other totalitarian system that we've experienced in the 20th century? Well, I think you could uh, go back and simply examine what happened in the areas of the world over which that rule was extended. And I think I mentioned to you what happened to Christianity in the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, I, I'm not to call, to call you know, something in the ninth century totalitarian could be slightly misleading. It, it certainly was intolerant. As demies, you were not allowed to ride a horse because that was a noble animal. You had to ride a donkey, which was unclean. You couldn't have a leather saddle. You had to have a wooden saddle. I won't go into all of that. Unfortunately, what has happened today, which may be closer to an answer to your question, is that you've had a conflation of Islam with Western totalitarian ideology. Again, to build some suspense for next week, I, I, I've also had the opportunity of teaching Muslims, Muslim officers in the National Defense University, and one of them said to me, he was a very pious Muslim, he said, you know, what Osama bin Laden says is 90% right. Any Muslim would say, yes, indeed, that, that is Islam, that's our religion. It's the other 10%. And I'd say, well, Colonel, where does the other 10% come from? That's what we need to look at. And if you, re you read the Islamist authors like Maududi and Qutb, it comes from Western totalitarianism. It comes from Lenin and Marx. It comes from the Nazis, whom they openly imitate and admire. 
So the question then arises, with everything that's on offer from the West, why of all things would they choose to imitate this horror? And that's what drives you further back into the nature of Islam. By the way, Father over there asked me to, if I gave the impression when I was talking about Islamic revelation, I meant by that what Muslims believe to have been revealed. I certainly don't believe Muslim Islam was a revealed religion. I hope that, that is very clear. Also, I should make clear that there is a brochure for the book out on the table outside, in case any of you... Mr. Riley, do Muslims believe in the soul, and what role does the soul play in their life? Excellent question. Do Muslims believe in the soul? Indeed, they believe in the immortality of the soul, and they believe in uh, the resurrection of the body. The part of the imago dei that is missing in the Muslim is the reason and free will, and that's the problem. Did history exist at the height of the caliphate, or put another way, did the meaning of history progressing end with the end of the caliphate? Does that make sense? Well, it's asking was there history during the caliphate? What, what there was, was uh, there were accounts of what great men did, which is what you hear in you know, ancient Greek history and every other kind of uh, what we might call history in the ancient world which really had a circular notion of all things happening and then repeating themselves. There was no linear time, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so the Muslims certainly wrote the accounts of the great deeds of their great men, but no, they did not have this notion of, of progress except in so far as the extent of the caliphate was increased. How does Salam as the objective relate to the idea of getting to heaven or an afterlife? How does the notion of Salam relate to the afterlife? It, it would relate to the afterlife in that achieving it here would be a prere prerequisite for having it there. However, you must know that that's, 